I apologize. <coughs> I'll start again. <laughs> um, so the, the title of the sermon is called uh, One Mediator. So you'll be there in, in 2 Corinthians 11. Um, and so we're going to look about what the scripture says about who the mediator is um, and who is an antichrist. That's somebody who puts themselves in the place of Christ and that's the definition of an antichrist. So in 2 Corinthians 11, verse 1, it says, Would to God you could bear with me a little in my folly, and indeed bear with me. For I am jealous over you with a godly jealousy, for I have espoused you to one husband, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. But I fear lest by any means as a serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your minds should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. For if he that cometh preacheth another Jesus, whom we have not preached, or if you receive another spirit which you have not received, or another gospel which you have not accepted, you might well bear with him. In verse 13 of the same chapter, for such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ, and no marvel for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Therefore it is no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness, whose end shall be according to their works. So I'll get you to turn to Mark chapter 13. Uh, but that, that's a warning that Paul's giving to the church of false Christs and false apostles, false deceivers who will come in and try to teach you uh, wicked doctrines and saying that even Satan himself can be transformed into an angel of light. So some of these guys can be harder to spot. Uh, in Mark chapter 13 verse 5, it says, And Jesus answering them began to say, Take heed lest any man deceive you, for many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. So we all know some cults where men claim to be Jesus Christ, like you've got some of those really crazy ones out there. Um, and they're easily shown to be liars, but that's not what the sermon's about in particular. But we know that just as now in the end days there will also be many who claim to be Christ, many who will deceive and will lead many away from, from Christ. And the Bible warns us in Revelation not to go here or there because it's not going to be a secret. It's going to be very public when Jesus appears. Uh, he's going to appear to everybody at the same time. So no one's going to be ignorant of that day, but there'll be people who will say that, you know, come over here, or we've found the Christ, and, you know, it says don't go into those secret places. You'll just be deceived. So we'll just turn to Matthew 24, Matthew 24, verse 10, because God doesn't want us to be deceived. He wants us to be clear on what's actually going to happen. So in Matthew 24, verse 10, it says, And then shall many be offended, and shall betray one another, and shall hate one another. And many false prophets shall rise, and shall deceive many. And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. But he that shall endure to the end, the same shall be saved. So that's talking about how the flesh will be saved. You'll make it to the coming of the Lord. You'll see him arrive in the sky uh, if you endure to the end at that time. That's not about salvation of the soul but it's often taught incorrectly as such. Um, Matthew 24, 23 says that, Then if any man shall say unto you, Lo, here is Christ, or there, believe it not, for there shall arise false Christs and false prophets, and shall show great signs and wonders, insomuch that if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. So there's at least some hope for us here. We know that we're not going to be deceived by this, because it says if it were possible, we would be deceived, but it's not possible. But many people will be deceived, and that'll be a way you'll also know people who are saved and unsaved. People who get deceived by these false Christs, you know that they're not saved. Um, but at the coming of Christ, that's the time of the harvest. That's the time of our resurrection. It's not going to be a secret. And Jesus is warning us, you know, not to be deceived if another comes and calls himself the Christ, the Messiah. You know, um, that, yeah, he doesn't want us to be ignorant of his return. And we do have, we don't know the day or the hour, but we have very concrete signs that the Bible makes it clear. And Jesus himself says, look, when you see these things happening, then you know the end is near. Before then, you don't know. And it's not going to be until you're in the middle of the, of the three and a half year period before the resurrection, you know, the seven year period, you're in the midst of that, that you actually know. Because that's what the concrete sign is, is the abomination of desolation. He says, when you see that stand in the holy place, that's the beginning of great tribulation, and that's when we know that the days are short before the Lord returns. So, you know, there's no pre-trib rapture, sorry. <laughs> you're going to go through tribulation if you're saved. 
And we can pretty much know that when we see that abomination of desolation, Jesus is coming back and it's going to be very short. But again, the sermon's not about that in particular. Um, but if you are interested, Pastor Kevin has done a series on that. Um, you know, he's done a great series on the coming of the Lord and on, on the revelation. Um, so I suggest you look at that if you want to know more. But I'll get you to turn to 1 John chapter 2. We're just going to read a couple of verses in 1 John 2, 1 John 4 and 2 John 1. But there are a lot more warnings, you know, that such men, these false Christs, will arrive, these antichrists, those who want to take the place of Christ. So in 1 John chapter 2, verse 18, it says, Little children, it is the last time. And as ye have heard that antichrist shall come, even now there are many antichrists, whereby we know that it is the last time. In 1 John 2, verse 22, it says, Who is a liar but he that denieth that Jesus is the Christ? He is Antichrist that denieth the Father and the Son. In 1 John chapter 4, verse 3, it says, And every spirit that confesses not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is not of God. And this is that spirit of Antichrist, whereof you have heard that it should come. And even now already is it in the world. If it's in the world in John's time, you can be sure it's in the world in our time. And 2 John chapter 1, verse 7 says, For many deceivers are entered into the world, which confess not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh. This is a deceiver and an antichrist. So there will be many deceivers and antichrists, even those who try and come into our church. And these are people who put themselves in the place of Christ. And at any time, there's already many antichrists who put themselves in that place. And we'll see shortly that there are entire religions today that are based around these antichrists. Uh, we know some of them, they're Jehovah's Witnesses, the Mormons, the Catholics, many of the Protestants, Islam and Judaism as well. You know, the biggest and most obvious example is, of course, the Pope and the Catholic priests. They hear your confession, they claim they can forgive your sins, and they'll hand out punishments. You know, these people are antichrists. They have taken the position of Christ as our mediator and our father. So I'll get you to turn to Hebrews chapter 5. In Hebrews chapter 5, verse 1, it says, For every high priest taken from among men is ordained for men in things pertaining to God, that he may offer both gifts and sacrifices for sins. Who can have compassion on the ignorant and on them that are out of the way? For that he himself also is compassed with infirmity. And by reason hereof he ought, as for the people, so also for himself, to offer for sins. And no man taketh the honour unto himself, but he that is called of God, as was Aaron. So also Christ glorified not himself to be made an high priest, but he that said unto him, Thou art my son, today have I begotten thee. So no man takes that honour of high priest, mediating between God and man. That was a position that was given to people chosen by God himself. Aaron and his sons, they were chosen of God. You know, he didn't take it upon himself to be the media mediator of his people when he would enter into the holiest of holies and offer sacrifices for the children of Israel. But Christ came and he offered that one perfect sacrifice, which is what all those other sacrifices pictured. You know, Jesus Christ came to fulfill all the sacrifices in himself and atone for our sins. So look down at verse 8 of Hebrews chapter 5. It says, Though he were a son... Yet learned he obedience by the things which he suffered. And being made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him. Called of God and high priest after the order of Melchizedek. So anyone after Christ's death and resurrection, that's where the new covenant began, because the testament begins with the death of the testator. So is that man who claims to be our mediator between us and God, that someone that tells you that they need to speak to God on your behalf, or that they have the power to absolve your sin, they are a liar and an antichrist. Hebrews 4.14 says, Seeing then that we have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession, for we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy, and find grace to help in the time of need. So my high priest is Christ. 
He was the first and only high priest without sin. He didn't need to offer, offer sacrifices for his own sin. But he took on the sins of the whole world, yours and mine. And that's, you know, he, he paid for our sins on the cross. He was crucified. And he earned that right to be the mediator between God and man. And it just makes me sick that people would take such a beautiful and holy thing and blaspheme it. You know, these wicked men, they're stealing something that belongs to God, it belongs to Christ, and something he paid for with his own blood. I'll get you to turn to Hebrews chapter 7. But the scripture is clear that Jesus' priesthood is forever, and there's no high priest after him. You know, so he is our high priest today, and anyone else who claims to be is a liar. In Hebrews chapter 7, verse 20. It says, And inasmuch as not without an oath, he was made priest. For those priests were made without an oath, but this was an oath by him that said unto him, The Lord swear and will not repent. Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. By so much was Jesus made a surety of a better testament. And they truly were many priests, because they were not suffered to continue by reason of death. So just a testament and, and covenant, they're the same thing. They mean the exact same thing, the new covenant, the new testament. You know, that's, that's what we're under. And it says all the other priests, they died, and that ended their priesthood. But because Jesus is never going to die, because Christ is alive and resurrected, resurrected, that's why he continues to be our high priest forever. And nothing can change that, because God says, you know, he swore and will not repent. So that's not going to ever change. In verse 24, Hebrews chapter 7, But this man, because he continueth ever, have an unchangeable priesthood. Wherefore he is also able to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him, seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them. For such an high priest became us, who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, and made higher than the heavens, who needeth not daily as those high priests to offer up sacrifice, first for his own sins and then for the people's. For this he did once when he offered up himself. For the law maketh men high priests which have infirmity, but the word of the oath, which was since the law, maketh the Son, who is consecrated forevermore. So it's just crystal clear that God has ordained Jesus Christ to be our high priest, and that's never going to end. Um, and what about that command in, in Matthew 23, to call no man father or rabbi? In Matthew 23, 8, it says, But be ye not called rabbi, for one is your master, even Christ. And all ye are brethren. And call no man your father upon the earth, for one is your father which is in heaven. Neither be ye called masters, for one is your master, even Christ. But he that is greatest among you shall be your servant. So, and these priests, these Catholic priests and other priests, they're just like the scribes and Pharisees of those days. They take names that belong to God, like rabbi and father, you know, and there's no exception here for the Jews to call themselves rabbi. There's no exception for the Catholics to call themselves father. You know, there's no exception at all. We have one father, one rabbi, one master, and that's Jesus Christ. Because these are names and attributes of God our Father and of our Lord Jesus. And these people are hypocrites. They demand that others call them these names, but they also demand that others live righteously, which they don't even live. In uh, Matthew 23, verse 13, it says, But woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For ye shut up the kingdom of heaven against men, for ye neither go in yourselves, neither suffer ye them that are entering to go in. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For ye devour widows' houses, and for a pretense make long prayer. Therefore ye shall receive the greater damnation. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For ye compass the and land to make one proselyte, and when he is made, ye make him twofold more the child of hell than yourselves. So they teach a false salvation. They destroy lives and they make merchandise of you through indulgences, prayer beads, other superstitious objects with other false teachings. You know, that wicked Catholic church, they teach you can buy your way out of purgatory, which there is no purgatory. That's just a made-up doctrine. That's something they made up to comfort themselves from the reality of hell. But the Bible teaches you either wake up in heaven or hell the moment you breathe your last breath. They also worship Mary and call her a mediatrix between men and God. And that's just such blasphemy. Now, Mary did not shed her blood for my sins. You know, they're making their converts two times more the children of hell than themselves. There is only one mediator between God and man, and that's the man Christ Jesus. 
You know, we enter into the Holy of Holies, we have access to the Father. We boldly enter that throne of grace. There's no commandment in the Bible. In fact, the complete opposite is true. We don't confess our sins to a man. We don't confess our sins to our brethren. You know, we don't offer indulgences to a man and no other man can forgive us of our sins. You know, what does the scripture say? It says if we confess our sins, he, that's the Son of God, Jesus, is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. I'll get you to turn to 1 Corinthians 15. In Romans 8.33, it says, Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifieth. Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died, yea, rather, that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us. And we, we read in uh, Matthew chapter 26 that Jesus said, Look, the next time you see me, I'm going to be in the right hand of power with my Father in heaven. You know, and by the way, a Jesus that's not resurrected in the flesh, he cannot make intercession for you. And that's where the Jehovah's Witnesses fail because they don't believe in that body, bodily resurrection of Christ. They don't believe in the name of Jesus, our Redeemer. You know, and for those that don't believe in a resurrection, you know, 1 Corinthians 15 has a lot to say about that. So we're going to look at that starting in verse, verse 1 of 1 Corinthians 15. It says, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand, by which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried and he rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. And go down to verse 12. It says, But now if Christ be preached that he rose from the dead, how say some among you that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there be no resurrection of the dead, then is Christ not risen? And if Christ be not risen, then our preaching vain, and your faith is also vain. Yea, and we have found false witnesses of God, because we have testified of God, that he raised up Christ, whom he raised not up. If so be that the dead rise not. For if the dead rise not, then is not Christ raised. And if Christ be not raised, your faith is in vain, and you are yet in your sins. So if Jesus didn't die a bodily death, if he wasn't the Son of God, if he wasn't God manifest in the flesh, as, you know, the, the Islam doesn't believe that he was manifest in the flesh. And there are many religions out there that don't believe that he was just a prophet. But if you don't believe that he came down in the flesh, he was God in the flesh, he died a bodily death, and that he raised bodily from the dead, it says then you're still in your sins. You know, there were witnesses to the resurrected body of Christ. He ate and drank with them after his resurrection in his glorified body and that's the body he's going to give us because he was the first fruits the first begotten of the father so i'll get you to turn to matthew chapter 6 but so you know what doesn't cleanse you there's no amount of how mary's or our fathers there's no vain repetitions that will cleanse you of your sins you know no man but jesus christ alone has the power to forgive sins and anyone who tells you different is a liar and a deceiver and an antichrist so in Matthew chapter 6, verse 5, it says, And when thou prayest, thou shalt not be as the hypocrites are, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and in the corners of the streets, that they may be seen of men. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. But thou, when thou prayest, enter into the closet. And when thou shut thy door, pray to the Father which is in secret, and thy Father which seeth in secret shall reward thee openly. But when you pray, use not vain repetitions as the heathen do, for they think that they shall be heard for their much speaking. Be not therefore, be not ye therefore like unto them, for your Father knoweth what things ye have need of before you ask him. So I'll get you to turn to Hebrews chapter 9. But you see, they pray in clear contradiction to the Scriptures. Everything that Catholics do is in contradiction to the Scriptures. We're commanded not to use vain repetitions as the heathen do. And what is a Catholic church but a heathen, pagan religion? It's full of antichrist. Now Jesus alone is our intercessor and no man can claim to stand in his place. The man of sin, the antichrist himself, one day he will stand in that holy place and declare himself to be God. Now, and that's the beginning of the end, the abomination of desolation I spoke of earlier, where he sets up an image of himself 
He's claiming that he's God, and that's why these priests are called Antichrists. Because this man himself, the man of sin, the son of perdition, he claims to be God. He's putting himself in the place of Christ. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 1. It says, Then verily the first covenant had also ordinances of divine service and a worldly sanctuary. For there was a tabernacle made, the first wherein was the candlestick and the table and the showbread, which is called the sanctuary. And after the second veil, the tabernacle, which is called the holiest of all, which had the golden censer, the ark of the covenant overlaid round about with gold, wherein was the golden pot that had manna and Aaron's rod that budded and the tables of the covenant. And over it the cherubims of glory shadowing the mercy seat, of which we cannot now speak particularly. Now when these things were thus ordained, the priest went always into the first tabernacle, accomplishing the service of God. But into the second went the high priest alone once every year, not without blood. Now that's important, not without blood, which he offered for himself and for the errors of the people. The Holy Ghost this signifying that the way into the holiest of all was not yet made manifest, while as the first tabernacle was yet standing. And go down to verse 11. But Christ being come and high priest of good things to come, by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building, neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood he entered in once into the holy place, having int- obtained eternal redemption for us. Verse 24, For Christ is not entered into the holy places made with hands, which are a figure of the true, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. So what does it say that mediates for us here? Who's earned by their own blood that place at the right hand of the Father through the sacrifice of their perfect and holy blood? Who was ordained a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek? Who alone has the power to forgive sins? And all these things point to one man, the man Christ Jesus, the Son of God. Uh, Just turn over the page to Hebrews chapter 10, verse 10. It says, By the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. And every priest standeth daily ministering and offering oftentimes the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. Those blood of bulls and goats, they could never take away sins. But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God, from henceforth expecting till his enemies be made his footstool. For by one offering he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. Hey, that's us. You know, for, whereof the Holy Ghost also is a witness to us. For after that he had said before, this is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws into their hearts and in their minds will I write them. And their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. Now where remission of these is, there is no more offering for sin. Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest, the blood of Jesus, by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, which he hath consecrated for us through the veil that is to say his flesh, and having an high priest over the house of God. Let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. So we are able as children of God to enter into that holy of holies that was reserved only for the priests. You know, and as, as it said in Hebrews 9, 8, that way had not been made manifest while that tabernacle was still up. That's the old covenant. But after the death of Christ, it was revealed that we now have access to the Father through the Son by a new and more perfect way. So how dare anyone claim that they can take that place? You know, you, that's a holy and sanctified position you know, you're a devil and an antichrist. Do you even consider yourself worthy of such a thing? You know, you did not die for my sins. You did not overcome hell and death so that I might live. You're not seated at the right hand of the Father. You don't even have the Father. So, like, when I'm in trouble or in error, you know, I need, either need help or I need my sins, you know, confessed or whatever, I go straight to God. I just get on my knees and I pray to God because he's the only one I can go to. I can enter boldly into that holy place and go straight before the Father and say, Father, I need your help. Or Father, I've sinned, forgive me. You know, there's no man on earth who can do that for me. There's no man given except the man Christ Jesus who's in heaven, seated at the right hand of the Father who intercedes for us. 
And uh, another point of that as well is that chastisement belongs to God. Yeah, he's the only one who can forgive sins. Um, in Revelation 3.19 it says, As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. We should repent to the Father when we are in error. Um, and Psalm 6 verse 1 says, O Lord, rebuke me not in thine anger, neither chasten me in thy hot displeasure. Have mercy upon me, O Lord, for I am weak. O Lord, heal me, for my bones are vexed. And it's the Lord, he's the one who chastises us for our sins after we're saved. We still have one mediator between God and man, which is Christ Jesus. You know, we have the ability to enter into the holiest of holies as children of God. So who is the one who can forgive our sins? Uh, I'll get you to turn to Matthew chapter 9. Matthew chapter 9 verse 1. It says in Matthew chapter 9, verse 1, And he entered into a ship and passed over and came into his own city. And behold, they brought him a man sick of the palsy, lying on a bed. And Jesus, seeing their faith, said unto the sick of the palsy, Son, be of good cheer, thy sins be forgiven thee. And behold, certain of the scribes said within themselves, This man blasphemeth. I'll just read to you from Mark 2, verse 7. It's the same story. He says, Why does this man thus speak blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God only? Luke 5.21 says something similar, same story. And the scribes and the Pharisees began to reason, saying, Who is this which speaketh blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God alone? We'll continue in Matthew verse 4. It says, And Jesus, knowing their thoughts, said, Wherefore think ye evil in your hearts? For whether it's easier to say, Thy sins be forgiven thee, or to say, Arise and walk, but that ye may know that the Son of Man hath power on earth, to forgive sins. Thus saith he to the sick of the palsy, Arise, take up thy bed, and go into thine house. And he arose and departed to his house. But when the multitude saw it, they marveled and glorified God, which had given such power unto men. So now the multitude was only partly right. You know, it's true that the power was given to Christ because he's the Son of God. It's not something that was given to all men. Uh, and nowhere will you find that taught. In fact, the teaching is clear. Uh, if you look at, uh, I'll get you to turn to Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1. But I'll read to you from 1 Timothy 2, 5. It says, For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all to, to be testified in due time. So again, even though God, Jesus is the mediator, it came at a price. It came at his sacrifice. Anyone who wants to take that position who hasn't paid the price that Jesus paid, Hebrews 1.1 1, 1 says, God, who at sundry times and in diverse manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person and upholding the things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high, being made so much better than the angels, a more excellent name than any other. You know, so the Father rewarded the Son by exalting his name um, above all others. You know, he paid that price with his own blood. In Acts 4.12 it says, Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men, whereby we must be saved. Now that name's not Jehovah. That name's not any other name. That name is Jesus Christ. That name is Jesus, the Son of God. There's no other name whereby we must be saved. Um, if you want to turn to Hebrews chapter 8, verse 1, it says, Now of the things which we have spoken, this is the sum. We have such an high priest, who is set on the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens, a minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle, which the Lord pitched and not man, for every high priest is ordained to offer gifts and sacrifices, wherefore it is of necessity that this man have somewhat also to offer. For if, we hear, if he were on earth, he should not be a priest, seeing that there are priests that offer gifts according to the law, who serve unto the example and shadow of heavenly things, as Moses was, was admonished of God when he was about to make the tabernacle. For see, saith he, that thou make all things according to the pattern showed to thee in the mount. 
but now hath he obtained a more excellent ministry by how much he is also he is the mediator of a better covenant, which was established upon better promises. And I'll read to you from Galatians 3.18. It says, For if the inheritance be of the law, it is no more a promise, but God gave it to Abraham by promise. Wherefore then serveth the law, it was added because of transgressions, till the seed should come to whom the promise was made. And it was ordained by angels in the hand of a mediator. Now a mediator is not a mediator of, mediator of one, but God is one. So the scripture makes it clear. There's one man, there's one mediator between men and the Father, and that's the Son of God, Jesus. He earned that right and that position when he gave himself for us. He's the mediator of the New Testament, and by his own blood he purchased that priesthood. You know, that honor and all that glory is his. And it's his and his alone. Amen. And so we're going to look at the new covenant. I just want to really drive this home. There's one savior. There's one redeemer. There's one mediator. And that man is Christ Jesus. And anyone who says otherwise is a liar and an antichrist. Hebrews 9.15 says, And for this cause he is the mediator of the New Testament that by means of death for the redemption of the transgressions that were under the first testament, they which accord might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. Like we would not have eternal inheritance if it wasn't for his sacrifice. And if he wasn't the mediator of the new covenant, the new testament. Hebrews 12, 24 says, And to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, and to the blood of sprinkling that speaketh better things than that of Abel. So that's talking about that blood of, blood of sprinkling. That's when Jesus Christ took his blood after his resurrection and sprinkled it on the mercy seat, not in the tabernacle on earth, but the tabernacle in heaven. That's what saves us. That blood on that mercy seat, that cries out, and that's what saves us. That was the sacrifice. That's what pays for everything. You know, th you just remember that the other tabernacle was just a picture, but they used to go in and they used to have to sprinkle blood on the mercy seat and around the altar. Well, that's what Christ did when he was resurrected. He did that for us. In Galatians 2, 21, I'll get you to turn to Galatians 3, verse 1. But in Galatians 2, 21, it says, I do not frustrate the grace of God, for if righteousness come by the law, then Christ is dead in vain. O foolish Galatians, who hath bewitched you that you, would not, you should not obey the truth, before whose eyes Jesus Christ hath been evidently set forth, crucified among you. This only would I learn of you, received you the Spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith. Are you so foolish, having begun in the Spirit, you're now made perfect by the flesh? So there are other wicked men out there that teach that salvation comes by any other way than by faith in Jesus, his death, burial, and resurrection. Men also like John MacArthur, who will deny the blood atonement. Yeah, he's a deceiver and an antichrist. Jesus' sacrifice was enough to please the Father, but some people think they can add their works to that. And they think that that will be a worthy sacrifice. You know, they might give lip service to faith, but they'll add in the deeds of the law, the works of the law, repenting of your sins, being baptized, whatever they want to add. They'll add that to salvation, thinking that their filthy rags have anything to do with it. But that denies the blood as well. And if they're winning, if they, their sacrifice, they're taking the place of Christ, because Christ paid it all. But they're saying, no, 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 let me pay for it. How wicked is that? You know, I mean, hell was, hell was made for a reason. But, you know, those things are not part of salvation. It's got nothing to do with the gospel. You know, they're liars and deceivers. And, you know, Galatians is a great book to disprove that, as well as Romans chapter 3, Romans chapter 4. Um, they teach just great things about how we're saved by faith alone. Um, so you'll be there in Galatians. Look at Galatians 1 verse 3. It says, Grace be to you and peace from God the Father and from our Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins, that he might deliver us from the present evil world according to the will of God and our Father, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. I mean, that ties in with Brother Jason's sermon this morning. We're pilgrims. You know, he came to save us from this present world so we can go to the world in heaven, so we can be with him. In verse 6, Galatians 1, I marvel that you see it. You are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of God, grace of Christ, unto another gospel, 
which is not another, but there are some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. But though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. As we said, said before, so say I now again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you than that ye have received, let him be accursed. So Paul here is speaking to brethren. He's addressing them and he's warning and rebuking them for being so easily misled by these liars, deceivers and antichrists. We came in and preached another gospel. And we're commanded that anyone who brings in such a doctrine is to be cast out. Any damnable heresy, that person is accursed. They need to be rebuked. And they need to be dealt with. Because we're not to have dealings with them as a church. A little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. You can't allow these people to fester in the church. God doesn't want them here. Uh, 2 John uh, verse, 2 John 1, verse 9. Uh, Whosoever transgresseth, transgresseth and abideth not in the doctrine of Christ, hath not God. He that abideth in the doctrine of Christ, he hath both the Father and the Son. If there come any unto you and bring not this doctrine, receive him not into your house, neither bid him God speed. For he that biddeth him God speed is partaker of his evil deeds. So David spoke of the man whose sins and iniquities are remembered no more, you know, to whom the Lord will not impute sin without works. And that's something people will try to deceive you on. You know, in the early churches, they were trying to bring that in. Works plus faith, or works, you know, faith plus circumcision, or faith plus, you know, whatever they want to bring in. It's faith plus nothing. It's just faith alone. And it even continues today with wicked men. So you'll still be in, you might, you'll be in Galatians. Look at chapter 3, verse 10. Galatians 3, 10. It says, For as many as are of the works of the, of the law are under the curse. For it is written, Cursed is every one that continueth not in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. But that no man is justified by the law in the sight of God, it is evident, for the just shall live by faith. And the law is not of faith, but uh, the man that doeth them shall live in them. Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree, that the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles through Jesus Christ, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. So we receive that promise of Abraham. If you're saved, you already received that promise of Abraham. That's the promise of eternal life. You've already received the, the down payment, the earnest of our inheritance, the Holy Ghost. But we go to the same way that David received it, by faith. And it's the same way Abraham received it, it's by faith. And it's the only way anyone can receive it. You know, no man can forgive your sins, and no man can give you access to the Father, but the Son of God, Jesus Christ. And in verse 13 it says, Who's redeemed us? Christ has. God has. The Son of God, Jesus has. It's not the Pope, it's not some false prophet, Muhammad. It's not the Imam or Joseph Smith. You know, it's not you, it's not me, it's not the Apostle Paul. It's Jesus Christ alone who's redeemed us with his blood. Galatians 3.15 It says, Brethren, I speak after the manner of men. Though it be but a man's covenant, yet if it be confirmed, no man disannulleth or addeth thereto. Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He saith not, and to seeds as of many but as of one, and to thy seed, which is Christ. And this I say, that the covenant that was confirmed before God in Christ, the law which was 430 years after, cannot disannul, that it should make the promise of none effect. So the promise was made to Abraham before the law even existed. And that's what it's saying here. The promise was made to Christ, to his seed, the heir of the inheritance, because he would come and, you know, and pay the price for all men. 3.18 says, For if the inheritance be of the law, it is no more of promise, but God gave it to Abraham by promise. You know, um, verse 20, Now a mediator is, sorry, verse 19, Wherefore then serveth the law? It was added because of transgressions, till the seed should come to whom the promise was made, and it was ordained by the angels in the hand of a mediator. Now a mediator is not a medi mediator of one, but God is one. Is the law then against the promises of God? God forbid. For if there had been a law given which could have given life, verily righteousness should have been by the law. But the scripture hath concluded all under sin, that the promise by faith of Jesus Christ might be given to them 
that believe. So the covenant, that's a covenant of faith. It's received by faith in the blood of Jesus Christ to cleanse us from all our sins. And we've seen so many times as well that he alone can forgive sins. Jesus is the mediator of that covenant and he's the mediator of the law. The old covenant was given because men were sinners that concluded that we're all sinners and we're all worthy of hell. But the new covenant is a new and perfect way. You know, in both covenants, you were saved by faith in the Lord's name. You know, and for that name today is Jesus Christ. It's the only name where we can be saved. Hebrews 7 verse 19 says, For the law made nothing perfect, but the bringing in of a better hope in of a better hope did, by the which we draw nigh unto God. And inasmuch as not without an oath, he was made priest. For those priests were made without an oath, but this was an oath by him that said unto him, The Lord swear and will not repent, thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. By so much was Jesus made a surety of a better testament. So again, we know the law is not of faith. Salvation's by faith without the deeds of the law. Keeping the commandments and repenting of your sins as works. Jonah 3.10 makes that clear, but there's plenty of other verses as well that prove that. Ephesians 2.8.9, salvation's not of works. And there's only one way to receive eternal life. There's only one mediator of the covenant that can actually give you eternal life. There's only one God who died for us, who's the propitiation for our sins. And there's only one Jesus Christ and Redeemer. So just don't let anyone deceive you in this. You know, it's the single most important thing you must believe, otherwise you'll end up in hell. And if any antichrists come in and they try teaching these lies, trying to deceive others, then that's our job, to not give them place and to rebuke them and chase them out the door. Hosea 4.6 says, My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge because thou hast rejected knowledge. I also will reject thee, that thou should be no priest to me, seeing thou hast forgotten the law of thy God, I also will forget their children. So don't let it be us either. You know, we need to read our scriptures. We need to know that these people are liars. The only way you're going to know they're liars is if you know the scriptures. You know, so don't lack wisdom because God says that if you ask for wisdom, he'll give it to you liberally. You know, if it, uh, James 1.5, if any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God. He giveth to all men liberally and upbraideth not, and it shall be given him. You know, so we don't strive about words to no profit. We don't argue with contentious people about things that don't matter, but we need to study the Bible and just know for ourselves so we can spot these devils, we can spot these deceivers. Because you, you, know, you might know, others might not, so you can warn them. You, know, you can warn other people in the church or you know, report to the pastor that, hey, you know, I've heard this is going on, this person's been saying this, this is wicked, you know, this person needs to be dealt with. It's just so very important. You know, we need to listen to good preaching. But God has this place here for a purpose. You know, we've got this church. It's a great church. We have a great pastor and great men who expand the truth three times a week. And I say we need to take heed to the teachings we hear. We need to try the spirits and study for ourselves. Because if you don't study for yourself, you have nothing to compare it to. You're relying on other people to protect you. But the New Testament has just so many warnings. There are just dozens and dozens of warnings against, you know, not having sound doctrine, against people who'll teach lies, who'll make merchandise of you, deceivers and antichrists who will enter into the church, and we know they will. So we've got to be vigilant to keep this church pure until the coming of our Lord. So I'll get you to turn to 1 John chapter 5. We're just going to close on this. 1 John chapter 5. And anyone who goes soul winning, you know these verses very well. But um, this is how we'll wrap up the sermon. 1 John 5, starting in verse 5, says, who is, he, who is he that overcometh the world, but he that believeth that Jesus is the Son of God? This is he that came by water and blood, even Jesus Christ. Not by water only, but by water and blood. And this is the Spirit that beareth witness, because the Spirit is truth. For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. And there are three that bear witness in earth, the Spirit, the water, and the blood, and these three agree in one. If we receive the witness of men, the witness of God is greater. For this is, this is the witness of God which he hath testified of his Son. 
He that, hath the bl he that believeth on the Son of God hath the witness in himself. And he that believeth not God hath made him a liar, because he believeth not the record that God gave of his Son. And this is the record, that God hath given to us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. He that hath the Son hath life, and he that hath not the Son of God hath not life. These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life, and that you may believe on the name of the Son of God. So why does this make me so mad? When people would put themselves in the place of Jesus Christ, who's done so much for us that no one else could ever do. I'll read to you from John 19. Because it, it says here that uh, there are three witnesses in the earth, the spirit, the water, and the blood, and these three agree in one. I'll read to you from verse 34 to 37 in John 19. It says, But one of these soldiers with a spear pierced his side, and forthwith came there our blood and water. And that he saw it, and he that saw it bear record. That's the same John who wrote in first John five. So he's speaking of that record that he saw. And his record is true, and he knoweth that he's what he, and he knoweth that he saith true that ye might believe. For these things were done that the scripture should be fulfilled. A bone of him shall not be broken. And another scripture saith, Thou shalt look on him whom they have pierced. And I'll also read to you from Matthew 26, 28. It says, this is the Jesus talking about the, new, the, the Lord's Supper. He says, for this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remissions of sins. You know, the blood of Christ is important. The blood of Christ is necessary. Because without the shedding of blood, there's no remission, there's no forgiveness. Without Jesus, we have no mediator between us and the Father. There's no salvation. There's no covenant, which is where all our hope is. If there's no resurrection, then we're still dead in our sins. And there's no hope either. But we know better. We have our hope in Jesus, the Son of God. He paid the price. He raised up from the dead and is ever seated at the right hand of God the Father to intercede for us. So we need to beware of those who would deny the blood, those who deny the resurrection, who would deny the mediator of our covenant, because they are antichrist. Now, Brother Sam, do you mind praying for us?